Okay, this is an interview for the Institute for Latino Studies at the University of Notre Dame for our oral history project. Today is Monday, March 10th, uh, 2008, and uh, my name is Tracy Grimm, and I am here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, with artist Raul Budillo. Thank you very much for agreeing to participate in our project. Thank you. Um, um, I want to ask you just to talk a little bit about your background, where you were born. Oh, and if you could give me the um, place and date of your birth for our cataloging purposes, um, and your early education. Okay. Uh, I was born in Topeka, Kansas, and uh, November 29th in 1956, and I... Uh, I lived in, in Kansas for five years, and since my parents were Latin Americanists, we traveled a lot in Latin America. And so I went to first grade in Costa Rica. That was my first. Uh, that's when I learned Spanish. Uh, and then as I was growing up, I, I traveled a lot back and forth between the United States and Mexico, principally Mexico. Uh, I, I, I went to the University of Illinois for my undergraduate degree in painting. And uh, I then traveled in South America for a year. When I came back and I, I lived in Chicago, I was working at the Field Museum. And during that time, when I started my career as an artist, uh, I took the materials that I gathered in in Latin America and put them together for my, for my artwork in, in those early years in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Where were your parents from? My parents were from, my, my mother was Italian-American, my father of German descent, but from North Carolina. Yeah. So my, my mother actually, uh, she was the first of her brothers and sisters to be born in the United States. And uh, when I grew up, that, that actually that Italian influence was very strong. I knew my grandparents and my my grandmother never spoke English. She never learned English. She lived here for 30 years. So the whole immigrant experience and is very close to, to me. Mm -hmm. When you were in Chicago, you mentioned to me the last time we met that you worked with Mario Castillo? Was yeah, I, I, Mario Castillo was my, my first art professor. He's the, the first class I had at the University of Illinois, he was, oh. he was the art professor there. And, uh, you know, at that time, I didn't know about his work in Chicago as a muralist and working in community projects. He was sort of an avant-garde artist. Uh, I saw a lecture that he did about his work, and what I remember about the lecture was that much of the focus was on his work uh, in California, which was largely conceptual. And... Uh, but I, I learned soon soon after that he also had this life as a as a muralist and working on one of the original uh, people that worked in the community projects that developed murals with with youth and so uh, I recently reestablished contact with him because I was part, I was actually setting up an arts panel for a conference we had at UWM called, or a symposium called, Who, What It Means to Be Latino. And so they asked me if I would set up the arts panel. So he came for that. It, it was great. Oh, when was that? This was last year. Last year. Yeah. And uh, my, my role in that conference was to set up the arts panel, and then I also brought the keynote speaker, who was Judy Baca. So that was amazing. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, Mario, Mario, uh, he, he had a big influence on, on the way I saw things. But curiously, it wasn't because of he was a Latino. It was because of his... Uh, he spurred everybody to question the arts establishment. So We're young students. We all had that in our blood anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wait, what year was that that you... That would have been 19... You know, 1974 to 1978 was... That would have been 1974. He left the following year, and uh, I think he moved to California mm -hmm. for a little while. Mm -hmm. So you were talking about um, graduate school. You were 
Yeah, so I, I lived in Chicago for, for, for five years, and, and I was at the Field Museum uh, at, working in the, as a museum preparator. But I was getting anxious because my works at that time had really strong influence from Chicano muralism and, uh, and from Latin American themes. I was still working with, with images that came out of my trip to South America. And I decided I wanted to go to Mexico and experience all of that more organically and sort of see what I could learn. And one way to do that was to go to graduate school. So I, I went back to school. I was in my late 20s when I did that, early 30s, I think. And I went to graduate school at the National University there. They call it San Carlos. And I, I remember walking in, I was going to be a sculptor ma sculpture major because I had become very interested in, in sculpture. But I didn't like the, I went into the sculpture department, it was a tiny little room, there was nothing there, and the sculpture teacher was mean. And so I said, <laughs> you know, I went to the, uh, I was living on, on the Zócalo, which is the main plaza there in Mexico City. It was a block away from the university, and I was between the Templo Mayor and the, the Palacio Nacional on a street called Licenciado Verdad, and it was a little arts community in a vecindad there. And they had frozen rents. We had, we had acquaintances that were artists, and they invited us to live there. So I remember going into the National Palace and seeing Diego Rivera's murals and uh, the, at the Alameda. And everywhere I went, I saw painting. I didn't see sculpture. So I went back, and I said, I changed my mind. I'm going to study painting. <laughs> and so I did my graduate work in painting. And, uh, and I was working with, with uh, Felipe Ehrenberg, who was... Also, I had met in Chicago, and Felipe, uh, Felipe was sort of the person that was working with popular culture, writing about it, and also doing artwork, uh, installation-based artwork about it. So that was really useful to me. In fact, when I moved to Veracruz after I graduated, well, before I graduated, but after I finished my coursework, I moved and I lived in Felipe's house in, in Hico, Veracruz. That's why we ended up going there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then my, my graduate work, my thesis was about the influence of, or the, the relationship between popular culture and the arts in Mexico. So I remember living in this small town in, in Hico, Veracruz, and and I'd look out the window, and I was I was reading books and writing what I could uh, that way. And I, I remember looking out the window and seeing these processions going by with a patron saint who was Mary Magdalene, and and I thought that's where I'm going to learn about it, not in here reading the books. And so I started becoming involved in in those activities, and, and uh, there's a lot of stories there I won't I won't uh, go into right now, but but. That uh, that experience was uh, I, I used I, it came to bear in my artwork a lot during the time I was there and also when I came back. So you were there for about eight years. Did yeah, I was in in the state of Veracruz for about eight years, in Mexico for nine, and in uh, in Veracruz we moved around all within maybe a fifty mile radius centering around the capital, which is Jalapa. We started in Hico, went to Coatepec, and ended up in Jalapa. Can you talk a little bit about your work and how it sort of developed sure. during that time and the people you worked with? Yeah, it, curiously, when I went to Mexico, I, I had the idea that I'd be well-received because I had all this work that was really, had strong Latin influences. Well, I, I, I was in the, the academy there. And there, what I found out is that there wasn't a, a good deal of respect for that kind of work. In fact, Mexico had gone through many uh, changes since muralism, and and uh, what what students that I was uh, studying with were interested in uh, was was very different. And my instructors didn't have a lot of interest in in it either. In fact, I, they thought I was Chicano. And so I remember 
in my conversations with uh, initial conversations with, in the studio where I was, the teacher, his name was Luis Perez Flores, and he's a, he was an abstract painter, Mexican abstract painter. He said, "Well, I can see that you're expressing the difficulty that your family had in the United States." And, and I said, "Well, no." I said, "I'm I'm not Chicano." He said, "Well, but but your parents were and." You know, so anyway, um, but it was it was a depreciating comment, and so then they thought I was a sold out Latino who had come to say this. So I was it was it was awkward. So I remember the effect that it had on my work is that I internalized what I was doing, and I became uh, interested in working intuitively, and I I dropped my social subject matter, I, not completely, but but. Uh, a lot of it, and, and a lot of that also had to do with moving to uh, the, 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 pro, the provincia, moving to a small town in Mexico, because there what was inspiring was nature. I was close to nature. So I was a woodworker. I had uh, just gotten out of uh, the university, and I had to figure out how to make some money, and so I started make, doing carpentry. And and in the process, I learned about the local woods, local woodworking techniques, and I and I and I had to relearn carpentry because in Mexico, at that time in that place, they didn't have power tools. They, if you had a table saw, you made it out of wood. So I made actually made a table saw, and I did all that, and and uh, I got to know the local carpenters, and we became friends, and that that those relationships uh, began to affect the way that I made art too. Uh, because I, through that process, I met this architect, uh, Danilo Veras, who recently passed away last year. But he, he was becoming quite well known, and most of his work when I lived there was in Jalapa, but later he did a lot of work in Cuernavaca. Cuernavaca. Mm -hmm. And his work had three influences. Uh, one was Gaudí, the great. Uh, Catalan architect, mm -hmm. uh, the organic forms in his buildings. The, the second was was uh, the the mission architecture, colonial architecture in Mexico, uh, which were these massive uh, structures that were stripped down elemental form. And then the the third one I always thought was like Walt Disney, because <laughs> he had this sort of fantasy uh, uh, forms uh, that he would incorporate into what he did. So he couldn't find woodworkers to to work with him because they didn't understand his forms, and he knew I was a sculptor, and and my work was uh, also based in in nature, and so it was a, a good fit. So I worked with him for a couple of years off and on, and uh, and there I learned about collaboration. He did too. <laughs> we had <laughs> we went back and forth it's about a skill. yeah. <laughs> And so uh, that was that was uh, also uh, something that informed how I, I later uh, developed uh, in collaborative art making. Mm -hmm. So I was in Mexico in 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 uh, Jalapa until 1980, 1998, and then moved to Milwaukee. Where did you meet? Um Leandro Soto? Can you oh, talk a little bit about yeah. that? Yeah. Leandro Soto was a, a Cuban artist who was working, living and working in Mexico. I had read about him because he, he was kind of well known. And I had I'd read an article about him, in, I think he was mentioned in Art in America at one time. And, and then it turned out the people that I was living with in Mexico City knew him. So I started hearing about Leandro. And, and one day I walked into. Uh, I walked into my, my apartment and there was this guy sitting there and he had on a rebozo. It was a woman's rebozo. And so it was unusual to see a man wearing it. And he was sitting cross-legged and he looked kind of like he was from India. And uh, he said, hello, I'm Leandro. I said, oh, you're Leandro. And I said, I'm Raul. He said, oh, you're Raul. So he had also heard about me. And so we talked all night. And uh, he said, you have to come and teach with me in this community he was working in, in the state of Tabasco. And that particular program uh, 
was called the Taller de Creación. And he had originally come invited by Irena Maishak, who was a, a linguist, and she had uh, been the wife in Cuba of the Polish ambassador to Cuba during the 80s. And she had helped foster a young group of artists that, that Leandro was part of uh, called Volumen Uno. And Volumen Uno was responsible for, uh, well, th these were uh, a generation of artists who began to question the revolution. They were children of the revolution, and so they had this interesting uh, dilemma. And so some, uh, the, the, there had been an opening in Cuba a couple years earlier before I met him in which Cuban artists had, uh, Castro had allowed them to travel to, to Cuba, Cuban, uh, Cuban artists who had left Cuba were able to go back and reconnect. And, and the whole thing was, uh, one of the key players in that was, uh, I always get this name confused. Uh, 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 the, she was a great, uh, Ana Mendieta. Uh, Ana Mendieta was a wonderful earth artist. From Iowa. Right, from Iowa originally. And uh, so she, so this connection with the with the Americans was very key also for this generation. And it was also a period of the sort of the heyday of the Cuban biennials. Uh, so there was a lot of international influence there. So anyway, uh, Irene helped all these artists have a place where they could meet and exhibit and critique each other's work. And when she moved to Mexico, she started working for the SEP, uh, the Secretary of Public Education, in projects that had to do with bilingual education. She was a linguist and uh, just an amazing woman. And so she invited Leandro Soto and some of the other Cuban artists that she knew to come and work in the state of Tabasco. And this is, a, this is a period in Tabasco when the, the wife of the governor was Julieta Campos, who was a, a great writer, novelist. And, and so she had, uh, she had opened up the state for, uh, and provided funding for all sorts of cultural activity. Everybody f was flocking to Tabasco, uh, artists, writers. She swore to open a, uh, sh or, uh, uh, pledged to open a library in every town. It was a great big deal. So he, th that's how the program started. But, but uh, when Leandro got there, he found that the kids in that community, he felt, were particularly uh, gifted or given to the arts. And it wasn't a community where color or paint was part of the, the natural uh, or the, the local uh, crafts. Uh, there the crafts were sculptural. Uh, it had to do with, with uh, building the living spaces that they lived. The housing was very beautifully constructed. Uh, the roofs were done. There was basketry was very uh, highly developed. They made wonderful mats and so weaving, uh, but not but not painting. So when paint showed up in the community, it was like a godsend for the kids. They were just <laughs> they they couldn't get enough, and and they they did do beautiful work. So anyway, he invited me to go work in that community and give sculpture workshops, which is what I did uh, from time to time during the time I was in Mexico. What was the name of the town? Again? The name of the town was Tamulte de las Sabanas. And it's about 45 minutes outside of Villa Hermosa. Mm -hmm. So we two have con continued to work together? Yeah, those were uh, exciting times for us because we were both living outside our native countries and we each of us was interested in what the other one knew about. <laughs> and so he in the United States, the art scene in the United States, and me in the way that the arts developed in Cuba. Plus we were sort of strategizing on how we could best uh, continue working in the community where we were. Um, when when he moved back to the United States. He moved to the United States before I did. And I came back later, and then we reconnected here. He, he at that time, was teaching at Mount Holyoke. And uh, so we started uh, collaborating again. And we did, had different kinds of collaborations. Uh, 
one thing we did is we brought work from this community f because once we left, the artists continued. They formed their own groups and they continued to give classes and teach the, the kids. So those workshops continued. Uh, so we would organize exhibits of that to bring it, of, of, of their work and, and bring it uh, to, the, to the United States. I brought two to Milwaukee, two of those exhibits at the United Community Center. Mm -hmm. And when we did that, we always brought somebody from the community too. So they got a chance to experience something outside of Tamupe de las Sabanas and take that back and do what they were going to do with it. <laughs> uh, and, and that also developed because at, at the university, I, I began, when I first moved to Milwaukee, I wasn't affiliated with the university. I was teaching in the public schools. And I, I taught in a bilingual school uh, for a year. And then I also was a sub all over the city. But I wasn't sent to art classes. I was sent to classes where they needed Spanish. So English was a second language commonly would be where I'd be sent. But I liked all that because it kept me in close contact with the Latino culture that I was, I missed it a lot when we came back. Uh, so Leandro, you know, I was involved with the United Community Center for that reason. Uh, I, I um, went to different organizations, arts organizations in town when I first moved here and to see who had a use for somebody with my <laughs> background. And it turned out that the United Community Center did because I was directed there by Mark Friday, who is a, a, a grant specialist at, at, on the Wisconsin Arts Board. He said, go talk to Sulai. And so I, I met Sulai Oskai and, and I collaborated with her on a number of different projects both my own exhibit projects and also bringing, for instance, the Tamute exhibits and other exhibits from Mexico mm -hmm. uh, because I still have my contacts there. So that's been a, a lot of fun. Uh, the reason that, that that arrangement worked well for me and for them is because they needed somebody who uh, was knowledgeable about Mexican art and I had just written a thesis about it and I was... And I had lived and taught at the University of Veracruz for three years. And uh, so I had a lot of experience also talking to the press because in Mexico, you always talk to the press if you're an artist and you have an exhibit. They come. Because <laughs> uh, art is a political, uh, it's a political tool there. It's thought of as, it's always important. And it's, it's traditionally been supported by the government. So, uh, you know, it, Artists, successful artists usually get government grants or have uh, some tie to uh, the government programs that they have. So anyway, I, I, I was used to seeing art in, in that terms and, and as useful beyond just uh, what it could sig signify for an artist. It's also out there in the public. <laughs> And it's not just in, in Mexico, it's uh, the purpose it serves goes, uh, oh, I, I let me put it like this, anytime an artist exhibits in a gallery, you're subject to restrictions, whatever they are for whatever gallery you're in. So the difference of the restrictions that, that came with, say, working in a place like uh, United Community Center were not differences that I was uncomfortable with. <laughs> That is using, letting my artwork uh, be a showcase for a political uh, event benefited me as well. And so I looked at it like a marriage of convenience. And, and I think it, it worked out really nicely. I do think that the United Community Center has a tremendous impact on the lives of the Latino community. And it's a tremendous social service organization. And so I'm willing to, uh, so I, I, want, I want to help that, mm -hmm. the organization any way I can. Can you talk a little bit about uh, your work, what we were talking about earlier with um, the lizard sort yeah. of um, <laughs> identity or 
Yeah, you know, I, let, let me, let me do, to, to introduce that, I'm just going to backtrack to Mexico for a second because I did say when I moved to Mexico, there, one of the things that I learned was there, uh, there were many Mexicos. There, there were 50 languages spoken. There were, there were uh, uh, modernism had Mexican uh, culture, ex or the, the, the country experienced modernism just as we did. They experienced modernity in their way. They experienced they were experiencing postmodern. In fact, it was really a postmodernist country from the beginning. All these postmodernist ideas were old in Mexico. So anyway, uh, I began uh, looking at at uh, the old manifestos from Latin America, from the modernist movements, and one of those movements was called Anthropophagia. And uh, in the at the time I was studying, actually, it was it, people were studying it and interested in it because uh, it had a lot to do with sort of postmodernist theory. But it's a movement that took place in the in the twenties and thirties in, in Brazil, and it was run. It was started by a poet named Osvaldo Andrade, and uh, the title came from from the word anthropophagia, which means to consume human flesh. And the concept behind it was to consume European culture, but to, to, to devour it <laughs> rather than to be subjugated by it. And so in doing so, you know, the idea was you would create local uh, cultures or, or the culture would develop on its own uh, aware of European culture, but with regional influences. So, I started working on a on an idea uh, for a sculpture of a lizard, and the lizard was representative of these pre-modern cultures in Mexico, or simply non-Western culture. And the lizard was about three feet long and then had a 12-foot beam on his head and the 12-foot the beam was painted with, with modernist motifs and the idea was you had these cultures supporting this modernism but and it looked like a weight on the head of these cultures which it was but at the same time if they moved their head a little bit the whole beam would fall and so there was that subversive aspect to it that I liked and um, I can't remember what I called it, but I took the word from a, from a poem from Anthropophagia. I don't remember the, what I called that piece. But anyway, the, this idea then of the lizard uh, sort of stuck with me for a long time. Lizards, I mean, they're one of the oldest creatures we have. They're uh, uh, durable, and, and uh, so I, I really liked it as a symbol. Um, so I'm, I'm now doing another exhibit with Andro Soto, and I'm reviving that lizard. Did you want me to talk about the lizard in Tamute? Or? Sure, yeah. So, so the, the reason I started working, one of the reasons I started working with Andro Soto is because he had seen an exhibit I had at the Museo del Chopo in Mexico City. And that exhibit included a lizard that had, uh, that included this lizard. And so he told me about a story that in Tamute, the local mythology, uh, and they had a lizard there that supposedly lived under the church and when they started drilling it's like a patron saint for the town when they started drilling for oil in, in the area it became an oil producing state they would have flash fires and the people in the town started saying that if if they drilled if they perforated near Tamulte that the church had fall that the town would go under and so the lizard had this special, special significance in this other area that I was just getting to know also. And uh, I could bring that full circle to India, but I'm, I love India. <laughs> I have a great story about that. <laughs> Well, you know, Tracy, this is interesting. One of the things that we talked about was um, identity. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of times when people study Latin American art that don't know about it in the beginning, we're attracted to what we know, which are the basics, as I was, to muralism or 
But it's so multifaceted and it's so broad and the experiences aren't limited to those things which are only local. They're also international. Mexican artists travel just as American artists do. And they uh, assimilate uh, in that way. So Leandro Soto is one of these traveling artists. He's been all over. And he spent recently he spent time in India. And so uh, Awam Amka, who's our Nigerian collaborator in this exhibit, also goes to India regularly. So I thought, I better go to India to see what they're all excited about if we're going to collaborate. So I went in January. And uh, I remember that the, one of the first things I did there was a workshop on traditional peach white painting. And so uh, I didn't know anything about that. I just knew that's what it was called. It was at the National Museum. And you could uh, go learn how to do it for $20. So I said, I'm going to go do it. But I got there late. So I went in, and they were speaking Hindi. They weren't speaking English. And every once in a while, there was a little English. I said, you know, can I participate? They said, yes. And, but I hadn't seen the peach white paintings yet, which everybody else had seen in the museum. So they were doing this traditional painting technique that was fascinating with natural dyes on a small piece of wood. And I saw everybody put a border, so I put a border. And they were doing a drawing of, of a central figure. So I thought, I'm going to draw the lizard. So I started drawing the lizard. I put the lizard on there, and I, and I was working on really on my exhibit idea, and I had this, this cage structure on the head that was going to go up 20 feet, and I'm doing like a little drawing for that. And I, and I raise my hand, the guy comes over, the painter, and he looks at it, and, and I hear some stuff in Hindu, and then somebody else comes over, and finally somebody says, well, he says, uh, what is it? And I said, well, it, it's a lizard. <laughs> He said, uh, and Chief said something back. He said, well, he says he doesn't, he says, you know, you don't understand that this is peach white painting. It's not just any painting. We're painting images of Krishna. And I said, oh, that's all right. I said, I can, I can draw, I can draw Krishna. I, so I raised the lizard. I put Krishna in there. But I learned that these paintings are used as backdrops for images of the saint. Uh, uh, not of the saint, of Krishna. And they, they energize it. And so in this exhibit that I'm doing now, I decided to do these paintings for the sculpt, for the lizard sculpture. So you have these influences that come from all over the place. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's important to keep that in mind in studying Latin American art in, in the United States. And I'm sure you're learning all sorts of stuff about that. I'm very interested in what you find out. So instead of putting people movements in boxes, you can't. You can't put people in boxes yeah. uh, and uh, as soon as you stop doing that it, it just changes the way you see the world. I mean, it, it did me. Yeah. And I'm sure others have that experience. Yeah. Kind of reminds me of when you were talking earlier about people assuming your mm -hmm. identity in Mexico. Right. Um, you know, so it's not just from the United States where people it's all over. It's all over, yeah. And, and it's going to be uh, more so uh, as, as the world gets smaller. You know, now the, the Mexican artists that you read about, many of them don't live in Mexico. They're, they've they've uh, moved to great art centers in the world. Some of them are in New York. Gabriel Orozco a wonderful artist who I met when I lived in Mexico and now he's now I think he lives in New York, and, and and the work that they do has international influences, and it should. <laughs> They're children of the world, you know. I teach American art history. It happens time and time again in American art history, where you're talking about African American artists in the Harlem Renaissance. In the Harlem Renaissance, you have different different uh, ideas. Some people feel that the work ought to demonstrate African roots and. Other artists uh, and, and, and intellectuals felt that it ought to represent the most cutting-edge modernist work. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, all of it is valid. Mm -hmm. Is there anything we haven't I haven't asked you about that we haven't talked about that I should have asked you about? I think that's a good place to end. <laughs> it feels. Uh, yeah. Okay. yeah. And what's the uh, what's the the name of the exhibition coming up that you're collaborating on? Can you just? Yeah. Uh, 
you know, did, did I talk about Walker's Point here oh, with no. Andrew? Let me just mention yes. that exhibit because that's the first one that led up to this one. In, in my collaborations with Leandro, I did mention that we did work as, as uh, curators of exhibits, but we also have collaborated as artists, and we did that in Milwaukee in 2002 in an exhibit called Confluencias. And uh, what we did is we worked with the story of Ogun, which actually had been recounted by Awam Amka from New York University, Nigerian dramatist. And uh, we had that story, the way he told it. And it's uh, the story of the uh, Ogun is a is an African Odisha, uh, also beloved in Cuba, and he's an ironsmith. And so he's the his his domain is war and art because he makes the tools and he makes the weapons. And so his story is the story of perpetual. Uh, building and destruction and building and destruction and so our exhibit uh, in both installation and performance did that and uh, the performance element is worth just explaining quickly we were moving in slow motion to distinguish between the gallery goers or the real world and the spiritual world and Leandro was in the front room of the gallery and I was in the back. And in the front room, we called it the real world, and the back room was the spiritual world, or, or Ogun's workshop. And so uh, we had simultaneous performance in which uh, what happened in the front room was projected on top of the performance in the background, in the back room. And in the back room, was uh, uh, the activity was uh, recorded and uh, being simultaneously broadcast in the front room. Uh, and so that's the way it was set up. And the experience was so rich that we were then invited. Uh, some, uh, uh, Linda Corbin Pardee, who had uh, invited us at Walker's Point, later became the director of spaces of the Union Art Gallery here in, or the Union here in University of Milwaukee. And she uh, invited us to collaborate again in a show called uh, Implosion. And so we're doing that in April. It's April 25th that opens. And we're, it's collaborative art making. Myself, Leandro, René Maldonado from Tabasco, from the Taller de, de Creación, that, that uh, was both of our students, and Aguamanca. And I don't know what's going to happen yet. <laughs> but I know it's going to be extraordinary. <laughs> Sounds like it must be. Usually if I don't know ahead of time, something more interesting happens. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.